All right, guys, we're back. We're here to do Married at First Sight. Season 16, episode 14. Excuse me, had to burp at the same time I was saying that. So let's get into it, shall we? I'm going to go ahead and start out with uh, Shaq and Kirsten. You know, I um, still don't believe Kirsten. Do I hope that she's telling the truth and being authentic? Yes. Do I believe that she's being authentic? No. And I don't care how you feel about it. So what do I have written here? Oh, yeah. So I don't want to talk about that one right now. I'll start with the communication. I saw so many problems with their communication. And with the other review videos that I've looked at, I think we all agree that something was going on between her and Shaq during that conversation where she was talking to him and he was in Memphis. He seemed very detached. I thought, watching it, as I was watching it, that maybe he was tired. But you could tell that his energy was down and that she was in a high place in her energy. Oh, honey, I miss you. Oh, I wish I could be there with you. Oh, we you coming home. Oh, yeah, no, you need to, you need to, uh, uh, five o'clock, four, five o'clock. You need to be on the road to come back, come, come back home. Yeah, oh my, oh. I just couldn't. And when I heard her, <laughs> I didn't believe nothing coming out of her mouth. I did not know, and neither did, you know, any of the rest of us until we got to that part in the program, that he was salty with her because apparently she was supposed to go to Memphis with him. And then at the last minute, he said that he was packing his back. I want you to go down there and listen to what he said and then go back and listen to what she said on the after show. They do not match. And I'm going to go through that. He said he was packing his bag and then she came in and told him that she wasn't going. And that made him start to feel some kind of way. If you listen to her on the after show, she says that she had an open house she said that her dad wanted her to plan a party for her grandmother. <laughs> and I can't even remember. I can't even remember what else, what else she said. <laughs> and so when did all of this happen, Kirsten? Are you serious right now? You're telling me that you waited until this joker was packing his bag. Then you went in there and started telling him um, all this other stuff that you got going on that I'm sure you knew before he started packing that bag. And then when you go and listen to her on the after show, see, this is what I can't, I cannot take this girl seriously. I really cannot take her seriously. I can't even get past this scene. And when she blew him that kiss. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and then she had to call him. She had to call him and be like, okay, I was trying to blow you. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I didn't know you were trying. <laughs> and he was like, I didn't know you were trying to blow me a kiss. And she was like, well, okay, I have to go. <laughs> Bye. And then she did a little, I mean, the sorriest. The sorriest. I don't know. This girl, I said I've been talking about Clint not knowing how to be romantic. Kirsten doesn't know how to be romantic. There's no... When she says, Hi, handsome. <laughs> Hi, handsome. And then she's, you know, 
have done her? Come here. Her hoe, come hither. Lord, have mercy, this girl. The fact that I don't, okay. Because they do have a camaraderie with each other. And I stop myself because I'm remembering them at the reception. Well, she knew that she didn't want to kiss him. But she still was able to have that jovial conversation, you know, with him. So when they're in a decent space, you know, with each other, I can. I have to admit it. I can see, you know, them doing the back and the forth. The thing is with Kirsten... She knew she didn't want to kiss him. And she knew that he was going to ask her eventually that they were going to get around to her having a deal with not kissing him. And she still was jovial with him at that table, knowing that he probably was going to want to kiss her and that she was probably going to tell him no. So this is the duality of her that we've been looking at, you know, this whole season. And I'm over it with her, and I'm definitely over with it with Eris. Do I wish that Eris would wake up one day and see Jasmine as a wonderful woman that she is and say, you know what, I'm about to lose something very precious and valuable. I would love, absolutely love to see that, you know, from Eris. Do I expect to see that from marriage? No. And at this point, um, I would have to hear, and I'm not going to talk about Eris and Jasmine yet, but I am going to say this. In order for me to believe that joker, he would have to say something about Jesus Christ. Jesus, he would have to confess Jesus Christ with his whole chest, mouth, tongue, ten toes. I would have to see all that, and I just don't think I'm going to get that out of Eris. Because when you go back and you look at what he said to Jasmine, you know, um, you're giving out lady, but I'm going to need you to give me whore. And just all the little stuff, all the way up until, you know, this last mess that, you know, he had to say. But I digress. At least the rant this time was something pertaining to the um, actual episode. I hope somebody out there gives me credit, you know, for that. Thank you um, in advance. But look at that, uh, Kirsten and Shaq. I did not appreciate when she was asked by Dr. Pia if she considered Shaq to be masculine. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I see why people say that they think that Shaq may have... Um, he, he may need to sit down and actually have a conversation with himself about his sexuality. I actually understand why people are saying that. And I understand why I'm trying to give him credit, you know, of being a heterosexual. My thing with Kirsten is, I don't think she's been authentic with him up to this point. And see, she waits until the experts get there. And then that's when she starts telling stuff. Instead of telling this man that, before. This is the issue that he was talking about in that last episode. So I was kind of confused with him as well. And I'm going to get to him. But when Dr. Pia asked her that question, the, the, the things that she said were so incongruent. She said that, yes, eventually. She said that, yes, she thought that he was masculine. And then she started talking about him moving the boxes, you know, to get their stuff, you know, into the apartment that they're in now. Nothing about her or anything that was coming out of her mouth made me believe that was true. The other thing that she did on the after show, she used an excuse. Uh, and I say excuse. Yeah, I use that word deliberately. Um, she said that when she had some groceries or whatever, and she asked him, or she called them, I think she called them or something, and, and said, well, you know, can you help me, you know, with the, with the bags? And he was like, I'm working out. I know, because Kirsten has lived long enough that she should be able to figure out how to do groceries. Now, especially when I had a car, 
I would take out my um, perishables. Those are the bags that I would take out immediately. If I had stuff like paper towels and cans and stuff that, that I could come, you know, I pick up later, then that's exactly what I would do. And I didn't feel the pressure to bring all that stuff in, you know, at one time. And see, this is another thing that um, bothers me about Kirsten. She sits up talking about she want a whole house full of kids running around. And you mean to tell me that you can't even figure out how to get groceries in the house? And how to figure out how to get him to help you get groceries in the house. Because you can let him know, hey baby, I went to the store and I got some stuff. I brought in the perishables, but I left the other stuff out there. Do you feel, can you go down, you know, and get it, you know, for me? And I'm sure that he would have done that, you know, for her. If, you know, she had picked the time, you know, to to bring that, you know, to his attention. And the other thing, you know, with Kirsten, I haven't seen her cook anything but cookies. And uh, whatever they had when they were at the, when they brought people over. I don't remember if they ordered stuff in or if Shaq helped her cook or if she cooked that by herself. So I haven't seen this whole Betty Crocker Thing out of her that would convince me that she had a whole lot of <laughs> that she had a whole lot of groceries for him to bring in anyway, you know. And it's just something I feel like she reached in the deepest part of her ass and just snatched it out and brought it on television. And then here go Rudy, co-signing that. Shaq, just go get the bags. And that was when I had to stop and actually go back and look and see that I hadn't put the the two parts of their thing in, the sex toys, and then him having that conversation, you know, with her about the, you know, her flaking on him, you know, to go to Memphis. And, yes, to go to Memphis. And so I had to interrupt that and put that down there because as you look at these videos, I want you to be able to get this information. It, it scares me. I haven't been this alarmed about um, the reviews that I'm looking at. I, you know, I kind of went to sleep on it, but now they're they're really alarming me again. I'm seeing this whole adoration and admiration for Clint. When if Clint is a sexual, and I'm not even a woman. I mean, I'm not even a dude. And as a woman, I get it. If Clint is as sexual and as powerful in his sexuality as he communicates and as he thinks he is, he would be having sex with his wife. I don't even think that Shaq and Chris are that level of dude. And they have managed to figure out how to have sex with their wives. So you mean to tell me, sex master Clint. <laughs> Clint is the master of masters when it comes to a woman's anatomy and how to get himself up inside of it. But you can't figure out how to convince your wife to have sex with you. I'm never going to believe that. And the other thing I see with Clint, and this is the title, he lacks self-awareness. When I heard him, go listen to him. I think it's the last thing. No, actually, it's two places in that after show where he runs his mouth and he doesn't listen. He speaks before anything has time to get into his brain and actually give him an opportunity to think about what he's going to say. He doesn't have that. There's no filter. Whatever pops into his head comes straight out of his mouth. <laughs> and he needs a filter. Okay? He lacks self-awareness. And you can tell that. Because when Gina actually says something to him, like he has no swag, he's surprised by that. And I don't know why. I, I do know why. And this is the disease of narcissism. Clint has a, a problem focusing and gazing on himself to the point where he can't see the the cracks and the flaws that are there 
he has gone blind to issues that he really does need to pay attention to. And this is the reason why his relationships aren't working out. I mean, if he had the stuff, I mean, the gravitas, the, the manliness, child, okay? Gina would be passing out. <laughs> that joke would come in the room. <laughs> she would just fall out <laughs> because of just the stuff <laughs> of Clint. And yeah, he doesn't have it. I don't know who Clinton has been messing with. <laughs> I'm scared to find out who he has been messing around with that has given him <laughs> this, this sense of himself. Okay? So the difference between, I think, him and Eris and their narcissism is that Eris actually has some self-awareness about him. I can see that and hear it. I've heard it, you know, out of him. I also, you know, see something in Eris that um, Jasmine is attracted to him. If he turned his stuff around the day and gave her the the understanding and, and communication that, yeah, you are who I want and this is what, you know, we finna do, he would be in the house. But... Part of what I think is going on with Eris is he has used this experiment as an experiment. I think he just kind of was curious as to what marriage would be like. And instead of him having to propose to somebody and do all that stuff himself, this is the perfect opportunity. He could actually have them pay for the wedding. They could go find him a bride. And then he could get to test it out for eight weeks. And if he liked it, cool. Now I got a whole wife and a whole new life. But if he didn't, then he is more than able to transition and just go back out into the streets. And become the three or four that we already... <laughs> that we know that he is. Okay? Okay. So, yeah, he is in his own experiment within this experiment. And it's coming at a cost to Jasmine. And if Eris thinks that he is going to be able to skate through life and not feel hurt and not be on Jasmine's end of life with another person, he is the, it, his narcissism is something else. I don't even know if they have that in the DSM, you know, that he's, you know, suffering from. Another thing, you know, with Eris that actually has me concerned, you know, about him, he has this, this, this cloud of death around him. And this cloud is connected. Like, okay, and I'm going to use mine. So, like, with my relationship with men, there's always been a cloud around me with my relationship with men. And like I, I shared on my other channel, this started in my house. So you talk about my granddaddy. He put us out of his house and put us into poverty, okay? My dad um, left us. You know, my mom had to end up raising, you know, two teenagers by herself and put them, you know, through high school. My uncle molested me, you know, when I was like, what, six, seven, six, seven years old. My brother can't stand my guts. This joke, he does not like me. He actually um, appreciates his, his friends, the people he went to school with. And they do, too. They love him. Like when my mama died, child, they actually pulled together some money and had a thing, you know, for him when my mama died. I ain't have one person from my <laughs> from my high school that called me to say I'm sorry. Nobody put up a card or nothing. So my brother has been able to have a social life and acceptance, and you know, a, a measure of success with people in his relationships that I never was able, you know, to have. So I totally understand what I'm talking about when I get ready to say what I'm about to say with Eris. Eris doesn't understand human nature. He thinks that he does because he said that he loves the game. 
And see, this is what I'm trying to explain when I said that the game doesn't love you. I said that back in videos past. With all this death around Ares, and especially that his dad did not get to live um, to be an old man. This man passed away, I think Ares said, when he was 11. And Ares, in the previous episode, read a letter to Jasmine that his dad had written to his mom. And he was apologizing. He was saying that, you know, now he was in a place where he could be a level of responsible that he wanted to be in Eris' life. And do you know that if that man had been able to commit himself to his family, he would have been somewhere with his family instead of where he was whenever the night, you know, that he was murdered. Whatever went down where he was murdered, if he had been able to pull himself together and to stay with his family, his outcome could have been a whole different, you know, situation. And Ares doesn't understand human nature. There are women out here who will kill him if they figure out that he is playing them. He does not understand when you mess with people, and especially now that they've had a chance to see him on television and see the way he moves and see the way he works. And if he ends up doing the wrong person, the same way that he has shown that he is able to treat Jasmine, a woman like Jasmine, Eric needs to really, he needs to really measure his steps because it's real easy to get killed out here in the streets. You can be extra cute. You can have it all going on. If you meet up with the wrong person and you move in the wrong way with them, they can affect how long you able to breathe and walk around on this planet. And uh, I, I don't want to see that happen to Ares. I hope Ares lives until he a hundred and he has his grandkids, you know, around his bed and they're able, you know, to sit up and talk about what a great man, you know, that grandpa, you know, was and how, what a wonderful husband and a father, you know, that he, that he, um, was able, you know, to become, you know, with them around his, you know, deathbed at a hundred. I'm just, I look, man, people like Eris, this joker, Eris needs to watch the way that he moves. And so am I done with um, Shaq and Kirsten? I have down here communicate. They both have a problem with their communication. I didn't understand Shaq when they asked him, hey, man. Are you happy? And then he started talking about that he was glad to be married. No, I think he said he was overjoyed. Oh, that's happy. <laughs> they, they do the most double talking. And it's like, I can't even, the, the times when I really want to be mad at Kirsten and just, you know, go up one side of her and come down the other one. I can only do it up to a certain point because then Shaq turns around and does something that makes me equally as um, annoyed, you know, with him. I don't know what he has going on. He sat there and told them guys that he was at second base with her. They're kissing now and when he was talking and they're being more affectionate. And he said that he put their relationship at a seven or eight. But then when they were in front of Dr. Pia, this time, Kirsten actually said that she thinks things are great. And I'm, that was confusing. And then she asked him, he said, yeah, no, things are rocky. These people don't know how to communicate with or about each other when it comes to a certain line. There are things that they can chit chat about all day like they did at the um, reception. But there are things that these people can't talk about. That house was one of them. When he asked her with the blindfold on, well, what things about you don't I know that I need to know? And she couldn't, she could, she swore she couldn't think of one thing to tell him after she had just told him that there are a slew of things about her that he don't know. This is the back and the forth. 
you know, just when I get, because, you know, I'm so thirsty. I really want to call, <laughs> I want to call Kirsten Lucy so bad. But every time I get ready to call her Lucy with that football and Shaq Charlie Brown, he does something that I can't do that. I can't do it yet. I'm waiting. And the minute I get to use it, I'm going to lay that joker straight out there. Because that's what I see with Kirsten right now. She is Lucy with the football in her hand, constantly gaslighting uh, <laughs> Charlie Brown that she's not going to do what we all know that she's going to do. But for some reason, he keeps convincing himself that she's not going to do it. This is the circle that I see Shaq and Kirsten, you know, continuously on. Um, okay. So I said that both of them were wrong about Memphis because she could have went to him and been like, okay, look, I know I told you that, you know, I was going to go with you. Um, this has come up. That has come up. How do you feel about it? You know, what, you, is it okay? Will you feel some kind of way if I go and do these things? And then I know that I said that I was going to go with you. And then she even said, when that guy, he have a break event, then I will, I will go. <laughs> and then the next time he had a work event, then now all of a sudden she got all this other stuff, you know, that she needs to do. Y'all know, I ain't doing it. Weird. Am I done? Please tell me I'm done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, this is one thing about the groceries that she was saying. I told you she could have took in the perishables. Like, I, I, I used to do and leave the rest of it, you know, down there. Or, they could have it delivered. When COVID hit, stuff that I actually was going out there to go buy myself, like cat litter. I mean... I stopped doing that. I stopped buying cat litter myself, and I stopped buying water myself. If I needed those things, I would order them and have them delivered. And that has continued after COVID. When I get to my next spot, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be uh, killing myself and pushing no carts and stuff, trying to get all this water and stuff to the house. It costs $5, $6 to have this stuff delivered, and it saves me time. It saves me energy. They could bring it right up. And she could say, look, go put it over here. Shaq could be over there working out. She could be over here coming from her computer, doing whatever, and just tell the man to put it over there, give him a tip or not, say thank you. And they could both continue to live their lives. But Kirsten to be using such superficial things to say um, that this is something that she's grading him on is in his masculinity is completely unfair. And also, before I leave them, I was listening to some other um, podcast. I mean, not podcasts, but, you know, reviews. And it's really shocking how entitled black women, you know, feel. I heard some women say that they didn't care about his credit. Okay? I want what I want. And if you're going to have a wife, then you need to be able to, your income should be the income we should be living off of. And if I want to take a vacation or we want to take a vacation, then we can use my check, you know, to do that. I don't even know. And this is the, this takes me all the way back to this whole, the, the, the nuttiness. When I listen to insanity like that, it tells me that you don't even know the system that you're living in. You're living in a capitalistic fascist system that does not care whether or not you take a vacation. And if you don't care about your husband's credit, your husband's credit is your credit too. Your credit is his credit too. And it gave me the impression that this was somebody that was teaching other people about finances, but then, you know, we're going to live off your income um, for the bills, and then we're going to do all the extra stuff, you know, off my income, and then what, this, that, and this. This is not the society that you're actually living in. That's some stuff that people were able to do at another time. You could probably get away with that depending on the on the profession. You might be able to do that. But see, everybody can't do that. And you can't be teaching people that this is the way that they need to approach their relationship. The wife is supposed to help the husband, okay? He the right leg, you the left leg. He the left leg, you the right leg, whatever, okay? One leg can't walk by itself. You need two legs in order for you to be able to move in a direction. And for people that don't get that, 
there's something wrong with you. And there's a, look, let me move because I think I'm done with them. Because I want to talk to my target audience here. And you, you guys know who you are. If you've been with me, then you already know what I'm finna say. And as a generational 52-year-old, I'm that's all I see is danger. I see danger. I see it from religion. And when um, I was listening to to this thing, um, and then you got two people on here who swear that they preachers, and um, they talk about Resurrection Sunday. See, that's dangerous. That's dangerous because you're too lazy and stupid to go back and actually read something that you say that this is your profession. These people are out here making money. What what they do, what people behind that pulpit do in these churches is equivalent to a doctor who has a scalpel in his hand getting ready to do brain surgery on you. And this joker only knows how to fix cards. He knows absolutely nothing about what he's going to do. But now you laying under under anesthesia and you got a joker with a, a medical equipment in his hand and authority to open up your brain and start trying to fix on it the same way that he would fix on a car. Knowing nothing about the brain's anatomy and any of the 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 work that he's about to do inside of your brain. This is what is happening right now. I see it in Christianity. What do I have written down here? It started with Catholics and Protestants. The minute that them jokers decided that it was okay for them to start killing each other in the name of Jesus Christ, that just unraveled the whole thing. Because now you got Democrats and Republicans. And Democrats are stupid if they think that Republicans won't kill them. Okay? You got Christians that'll kill you. This ain't even got nothing, nothing to do with politics. You got Christians that will mow you down because they don't agree with the fact that you're getting ready to go have an abortion. Some of that's not their business. They have absolutely no business about what you finna get ready to do, wherever it is that you finna get ready to do it, if it's lawful for you to, for, for you to be engaged in it. And they refuse to understand that. This is how dangerous these people are. And these are people in your own family. I'm telling you, if you actually go, and this is for non-believers, because uh, I'm Christian. I suppose I already know this. You go look in Matthew 24. There's a prophecy in there. And the Lord says that in the last days that the love, that the love between people will wax cold. And it's going to happen with Christians first. Them jokers would kill you. Because they believe that this is something that they are allowed to do in the name of Jesus and that they are not going to go to hell because they're doing it in the name of Jesus. Because their religion and their religious nuts have taught them that this is okay for them to do. Because it's almost like the whole infidel thing that Muslims do. And then I got Democrats and Republicans. I got Muslims and Christians. I got um, Jews and Muslims. I got men against women, Adam and Eve. I got the Hatfields and the McCoys. The Hat, because that's where we headed. I don't know for you guys in my target age group. Go back and read about the Hatfields and the McCoys. And the, the, you're talking about people who had a feud so long, they forgot what they was even fighting about. All they knew was that it was a Hatfield that had to kill a McCoy. Or a McCoy that had to kill a Hatfield. <laughs> there was just no rhyme or reason to. And that's where we had it. People are not even going to be able to articulate in a clear, concise manner that makes any sense why they run around out here killing their own brothers and their sisters. And, and if they think that the Lord is going to allow them to be anywhere near him, it tells me again that that's how ignorant that they are about the book that them will beat you over the head with, okay? Go in there and go find out what he said to Eli. So this is in 1 Samuel. And Eli was a high priest. And that joker did not um, discipline his children. And he allowed his children to do 
and 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 be blasphemous and be heretical against the Lord. And the Lord told him, go find out what the Lord told him that was going to happen to Eli. See, Chris, I, and nobody taught me that. Nobody taught me that about Eli. I had to go in there and go read it for myself. This is how dangerous it is. Big Mama has lied to you. Your grandfather has lied to you. Your daddy, your mama, your uncle, your preacher, and everybody else that you have run into, they are lying to you about what's inside of that book. You're going to have to go in there and go get it for yourself. They are too stupid to go and read it and repent and say that they have been wrong about what they've been out here teaching. They'd rather die and be wrong on all these lies that we have been told than to go and find out the truth and go and repent and ask for forgiveness and say, hey, I've been out here teaching Easter for, what, 20, 50 years, and I was wrong because they know how stupid they're going to look. How much money have you made off of them lies that you told because you didn't want to sit down and go read what you said that you was doing? How many people have you rebuked in error? Especially like me when I'm up here trying to tell you the truth. You'll ignore me. And you're going to end up somewhere that you say that you swear you don't want to go. Because you don't want to go and tell the truth. All these people, all these people, the religious people, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Democrats, the Republicans, the Muslims, the Christians, the men and the women, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hatfields, the McCoys. None of them wanted to be able to tell themselves the truth. But they ain't got nothing else but truth to tell to the other person. I promise you, you come down to my comments with your nutty mess, trying to come to me with what you think is the truth, I have some to give back to you. So if you don't want to hear the truth, then don't be bringing none of it into my comments that you think are going to be um, daggers against me. If you're giving me the truth, let it be edifying truth, something that I do need to know so that it can help me, you know, grow as a human being. That kind of truth, you know, I'm open to. Even if it's something that I don't want to hear, okay? But don't come to me when you have it. I had, a, like I said in the other video, I had one person say that, what is it? Trauma bonding. Say trauma bonding is not even a thing. And I'm like, okay. I just went, I didn't even respond right away. I went and, and put in a search. Trauma bonding. Do you know how many articles came up about trauma bonding? Didn't even go and look into, said that trauma bonding is not a thing. It came to me with it in ignorance. And they're going to say, oh, well, yeah, and sometimes your captions be, ew. But you, but you inhaling my content. You're looking at the content that I'm providing you. None of these other reviewers are giving you the content that I'm giving you. But you're going to come to me with your salt and your stupidity and your ignorance and try to put me down. I'm not a professional in this. I'm sure I'll get better. And there's a reason why. I do these videos the way that I do. I don't know if I actually do them more professionally, if um, Married at First Sight would, would um, flag them. I do them on the fly like this because I'm hoping that this is allowing me the opportunity to be able to upload this stuff. And it's another reason why I don't do, you know, the whole advertisement, you know, thing about money and, and this, that, and the third. Because it's more important for me to get you the information than it is for me to be doing all that plug and, and, and all of that stuff. So there is a reason why I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. And I'm not the most video savvy, you know, person. Like the live that I did the other night. And this is a rant. And I'm going to go on it and just hang in there with me. But the live, I've never done a live on this channel. The live that I have done, I wasn't doing it to talk to people. I was doing it because that was the only way that I could figure out how to make my phone upload videos to the channel that I was trying to work on. So I've done a live before and I've talked to people, but I'm an Android phone user. This whole iPhone thing, this is a whole new experience for me, and I couldn't figure out how to look at my chat. So, I'm not the most 
technically, you know, savvy, you know, person out there. I actually understand more about tech than I have in front of me, you know, at this point. Like, especially now, you know, um, with the whole fire, you know, and everything. But I digress. I'm just saying I know that there are things that I can improve on, you know, to make my channel better. And if this is something that I want to continue with, I probably will, you know, get better. But the reason why I'm doing it does have a level of methodology and thought behind it. Can I do it better? Yes, I can do it better. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that now. So that's an ability to be able to take some of the criticism that I've gotten for the way that I put my stuff up on the channel and be able to admit that, okay, yeah, there's some things, you know, I could do, you know, that are better. This is an example of what I'm trying to explain to you. And I hope that that was, you know, clear. So in going with all of that, you look at the three major religions. That is Christianity, uh, Islam, and Judaism. And they are all supposed to fall under the, the um, umbrella of Abraham. Now, if Abraham were to, come, were to come back here today, how do you think that he would feel about three religions? You got how many people around the globe make up these three religions? And they can't get along with each other. But they all say they came from the same place. That's crazy. That's crazy. So who else am I talking about? I'll talk about Eris and Jasmine because I'm not going to linger on Eris. I'm over him. Okay? I really am over him. I didn't appreciate that he told Jasmine's sister that the reason why he was clapping was because he got that idea from uh, Cal, from Dr. Cal. That was completely unnecessary. And it was just another thing. If she had that, because if you go back, and if I can think about it, I might do a flashback where she was um, at the reception and she was saying that she thought that, they, you know, her husband was attracted to her. And that, I think she referenced him clapping uh, for her when she came down the aisle. And we come to find out now that he's snatching that back. So if that was something that she was using to try to hold herself to him, he just took it and just, just dipped it in a bucket of feces. So it's like, well, why did you do it, Eris? Why did you do it if you're going to just confess to her later that you only did it because somebody told you to do it? And then when they were at the um, sink or whatever, at the counter cutting up the vegetables, she was um, telling him that this is what her sister relayed back to her. He was like, well, what did you want me to do? How about you just stand there, Eris, like every other grown, and just wait for your wife to meet you at the altar and introduce yourself? I mean, it's like he hadn't even seen this show. What did you want me to do? Why don't you be honest with yourself and her, Eris, at a time when you sitting up giving her vows about what love is? This is... And this is another reason why I'm not going to stay long with Eris and um, Jasmine. I, again, did not appreciate his communication when Dr. Pia was there. And Jasmine was saying that she couldn't respond to him anymore because she felt like he was just asking her questions just to ask her. And she was calling him out. And Dr. Pia was like, oh, well, she's calling you out. How do you feel about that? He said, great. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I just see that as a mind fuck. And I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to do that. But I just see it as him, you know, just have her, like you have the little, because um, I got two cats. And you know how you have a little red light? <laughs> and you be messing with them, and they be running around trying to get the little red light. That's what he doing. And the same thing I feel like Kirsten, you know, is doing with Shaq. Am I done? Because I'm, I, and look, Eris better be careful. I'm telling you, he really need to, to really be careful. Um, 
And if I have anything to say else about them, I, I'm going to have to pick it up on the next episode because I can't be bothered, you know, with Eris right now. Okay, so we're doing Clinton Gina. And like I said earlier, yeah, Clint has no self-awareness. He has no game. I'm glad that he finally got a haircut. On the after show, that joker finally got a haircut. Do I wish he had actually done something else? Yes. But am I glad he got a haircut? Yes. It shouldn't have taken him this long. And I believe that the only reason why he got one is because somebody on production must have told him that Gina was telling him the truth about getting a haircut. Otherwise, he wouldn't have got one. Because he's not listening to anything coming out of her mouth. But he wants to get inside of her drawers. Okay, Clint. See, this is, oh, oh, oh. But he has no game. So Clint and Nicole, uh, not Clint and Nicole, Nicole and Chris. <sighs> I love Nicole. It pains me to hear Nicole. I'm glad that Chris has really been patient with her, and I hope that he has been sincere, that he's listening, and he appreciates her journey, um, and... He is going to be there to support her as she works through, you know, her trauma. And I can identify with Nicole and her trauma. I already told you <laughs> about the first four dudes that I was ever introduced to in my entire life. The first four foundational, fundamental people in my life. And I just told you about them. So just look at 52 years of wreckage with men. I have rarely had a successful relationship with a dude. And I'm talking about friendship or relationship, really. I don't even think I can remember a successful relationship. Yeah, so. But I have managed, like, my um, high school teachers were amazing, you know what I mean? I've met some amazing men that have helped me, you know, in my life. But romantically, child, if you talk about the shittiest show on earth, as far as that is concerned, I hope that, you know, um, this thing that Nicole is doing with Chris is something that's going to do for her what, what she needs, you know, in order for her to step into herself. And whether it actually ultimately works out, you know, or not, that this work that she's putting into this and into the show, I agree with Rudy that the 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 effort and the energy that she's putting out on on this show, I think is really going to be helpful, you know, to a lot of women. So I tip my hat, you know, to Nicole. All right, so I managed to talk about this for forty seven some odd minutes, and I'm going to get out of here. Um, I was possessed to do this this evening. And I hope that I got everything. Um, I got some other stuff that I'm going to share, but I'm going to do it on, you know, some other um, video. Like I'm going to do, and I'm going to let you know what I'm talking about. So I've got a story time <laughs> that I'm going to do about um, my teeth. And a lot of people will talk about Jasmine's teeth because I used to have a gap. And I got braces, you know, when I was in my 20s and changed, you know, the look of my teeth. So I understand where people, you know, are coming from, you know, with her. Um, and I understand that she may have, have taken steps, you know, to have that corrected. And if she did, hats off. So I'm going to talk about stuff like that and um, do a mini story time, you know, in between. I think I got everything, like I said, if I did not pick it up, you know, on the next episode. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time in Passover. I've uploaded everything. I did this video. So, yeah, the rest of the time, I'm going to give it to the Lord. Y'all take care, and I'll talk to you on the next uh, video.